first of all, thank you. I'm very excited to be here to talk to you. Um, the theme of our discussion is going to be around uh, the art and science of customer experience and how you think about continuing to innovate for that as you grow and as you start to grow your way into contemplating things like, is it time to segment my customer base and what does that mean? So that's what we're here to talk about. I will say I'm much more interested in talking about segmentation from a customer's perspective in terms of what do we do for our customers, how do we innovate for them. I'm less interested in it from a spreadsheets and, and finance perspective around P&Ls, so it's gonna be much more from a customer perspective. Hopefully that's okay with everybody. And the other thing I'll say is that I think anytime you're talking about something like this, it's very situational. And so I wanna start by walking you through a little bit of what my experience and my background has been so that you know where I'm coming from when I talk about this. Um, but your mileage may vary, and so you might apply different, uh, different things to your situation and, and, and have different outcomes. So, but from my perspective, I started off in my career doing e-commerce uh, web development, integrating ERP, CRM, online, and, and native product systems, and how all the, that data flowed across each of those systems, which was very interesting for me, and I've sort of kept that sense of how does the data flow about the customer through all parts of your business with me, throughout my career, and I think that's very relevant for customer experience and customer success, and it's super relevant for segmentation. Um, from, from there, I went to Bizarre Voice. I don't know if, how many people are familiar with Bizarre Voice, but I was there, ooh, yay, good. <laughs> Bizarre Voice brand recognition, I'm sure they're glad for that. Um, I was there for, I, I think I was maybe one of the first 25 or 30 employees and got to see that grow. I was actually the first customer success leader at Bizarre Voice, and that was back in 2007. So if you saw a guy's chart this morning, where customer success started to take off from 2012 and up. This was five years before that, when we were, it was really kind of a green field. Uh, and so that was a really interesting experience. And then from there, I've led uh, client services for a few other Austin startups. And uh, you know, Black Locust was one of them. They were acquired by Home Depot. Um, Edge Case was another, where um, it was very early stage, first seven employees really just got angel funding, just trying to figure it out with a proof of concept. So uh, through all of those different experiences, I've seen a range of very large customer bases to very small customer bases, and a wide range of a mix of enterprise and SMB and mid-market and all of that. So um, that's kind of the perspective I'm gonna try to bring to this. Um, but I'm currently at WP Engine, and I wanna talk a little bit about that, because I think we have a really interesting use case when we talk about segmentation. So WP Engine, first of all, how many of you are familiar with WordPress? Okay, good. So for those of you who aren't, WordPress is the, the largest open source content management platform. It's also the fastest growing content management platform on the web. Some staggering statistic is something like 19% of the, of the domains on the internet are powered by WordPress. So it's very prevalent, it's very universal. WordPress appeals to all uh, sizes and, and shapes of customer, from very small prosumer or personal sites to very large enterprise concerns. And WP Engine is a managed WordPress uh, provider, so we power a platform around WordPress, which means anyone in that ecosystem, very small or very large, we have a place for them. And so that's a really interesting problem to try to solve. We have over 25,000 customers, and so how do you support, how do you really innovate to create a great differentiated customer experience for 25,000 customers? Um, that's, that's an interesting challenge, so we'll talk a little bit about how we do that. The, the most basic way to start from this would be to say, well, let's think about it from a pricing and packaging perspective. At the very basic level, um, if you have a product or a service offering that has a very clear delineation of uh, different additions or plans, then that's the, that's the most basic level because there are certain features or entitlements or things about your product or service that are already spelled out in black and white that some customers get this and other customers get that. So you can kind of start from there. And, and one question and something I would encourage you to think about is, don't feel like you have to be very tightly coupled to that in terms of how you think about something like customer success, how you design programs around nurturing customers at all of those stages. Um, you, wanna, you wanna be mindful of that, but it doesn't have to be directly tied to that. So one question just to kind of get a sense for the people in the room, how many of you in your organizations today have some concept of segmentation where you have some division of, of teams or customer base? So that's the majority. How many of you have, it's kind of one size fits all, it's all one, one shared pool. Okay, so what's interesting is that everyone kind of starts there. And, and, and I, I listed, you know, you can break it down from a pricing and packaging perspective. It often gets more complex than that and you start to think of it in terms of, well, you could segment by region. You could say there's the US, EMEA, and APAC. You could do it by industry and say, let's think about retail or manufacturing or automotive or financial services. Uh, you can also do a mix of those. You might say, uh, in the US, we're gonna focus on industry, but internationally, we're gonna treat it by geographical region or by country. 
So it, it really just all depends. And we'll talk a little bit about how do you figure out what's right for you. But I, I do just want to point out that it should be pretty organic. It should come from a place of what do you need and what do your customers need. And so for those of you that are starting at this place of I don't really have any concept of segmentation yet and I don't know when or if I'll ever need that, you're kind of in what I would consider that one size fits now, which is you don't really need to worry about it yet, but be thinking about it and, and we'll talk about what are some of the indicators that you can look for to tell you when it might be time to, to go down that path. And I would also say that for those of you that already have some level of this maturity, you're constantly gonna be iterating on that and nothing is ever gonna stay completely the same. So you might also be thinking about, is that the right segmentation model or are there other ways you wanna divide or, or think about your customer base? So with that, um, I think we should talk a little bit about well, what is a segment? And I, I, I think I'm just stop saying the word segment because I'm counting in my mind how many times that word's come out of my mouth. So maybe, maybe let's take that down a notch and just think about it as a cohort or just a group, people that share a similar pattern. And the way I would break this down for you is to think about the pattern as a combination of what are the needs and priorities of your customers, and how does that align to the activities and the metrics of your team and your business. And, and those four criteria or those four aspects in common really create what I would consider a segment or a cohort of customers that you can think about as a, as a similar group. Uh, and so what do you do with that? Well, first of all, let's, I want to talk a little bit about what this means. So, what I mean by a need is that could be an entitlement, back to the whole pricing and packaging thing. It could be, I, I have a pro version of this product and therefore I'm entitled to an account manager or I get a dedicated phone number for support or I get 24 seven ticket response or, or whatever those things are. It could be an entitlement or something that, that they need to have that's part of their vetting process. That doesn't necessarily mean it's a priority for them. So there could also be things that customers deeply care about that may be part of their needs or may be completely different and you have to understand what are the things that are, that are grabbing your customer's attention. And, and that may be very different and you may want to respond to that very differently. On your side, thinking about it in terms of activities or metrics, um, I want to talk about activities separately but just kind of focusing on metrics for a second. What I mean by this is how are you going to define success? How do you know um, within different cohorts or groups of your customers there are lots of different metrics. I'm sure there's probably several sessions here, or at least one talking about what are the right metrics for customer success. There's lots of things that come up. It could be retention, it could be growth, it could be things like customer marketing or referenceable accounts or case studies and testimonials and those sorts of things. Depending on a different segment of your business, you might weight those metrics differently, and that's okay. So for instance, if you, if you are just breaking into emerging markets or just breaking into international, you might be much more uh, focused with those teams or those customers on getting that first great case study or getting that first sort of landmark customer that can be your referenceable account, be that success story that, that creates that wave of success around them in that market, do you, may, you might weight that very differently then in that market than you would in an area where it's very established and you don't need another case study that looks exactly the same as the other 10 you have. It's much more about retention or growth. And so that's okay. But the, the important thing, and so Maybe the first thing I'll say is, uh, from a, a homework assignment, one of the things that, that the group running the conference asked us to really focus on is, how do we make this actionable for all of you? So here's one thing that you can do tomorrow, when you, or Wednesday, when you get home to your teams. Think about this in terms of your customers today. If you were to try to divide them into groups, what's the smallest, logical, you know, least common denominator of groups that you could come up with that are reasonably coupled by these four criteria, where they share common needs, priorities, activities, and metrics. And that's a place to start. And maybe that looks exactly like the segmentation strategy you have today, or maybe you're earlier stage than that and you, don't, you, you haven't started to create that division yet, but it might be an indicator of when that comes, here's the first place it might come, and it can help you prepare for that. So I haven't said much about activities. I wanna skip over to that. So with activities, I really wanna encourage you to think about activities from a customer perspective, and please, please, please come to it from a perspective of that customer life cycle. For those of you that are in the last session, you heard a lot about that customer journey mapping. That's the right approach to take for something like this. I would not encourage you to ask each sort of subgroup or some team, ask customer support and sales and sales engineering and account management and all these other groups to come up with what they think the right activities are to make these customers successful. I would pull it up to the level of what's the customer's experience with your brand? and start from that. And think about, so, so homework assignment number two would be, take that list of potential cohorts or segments or groups of customers 
and now think about with your teams, maybe do a brainstorming session or a workshop with them to do a basic start, stop, continue exercise. Think about the activities you're doing today and what would you like to start doing different? And maybe it's only for some people. Maybe when you go through that exercise, you say there's this one group of customers where it wouldn't make sense for everybody else, but for them it would be really impactful to send that holiday email or to have that personal outreach from a C-level executive or whatever that thing might be, that activity might be. Different activities will make sense to different segments or groups. And it's also good to think of it in a distinction between is it time-based or event-based. So a time-based activity might be what do we do right after they sign on as a customer? What do we do uh, when they're coming up for their first renewal or uh, something like that, or for holidays? An event-based example might be what do we do when they get their first support ticket? What do we do when they hit their first milestone in terms of their utilization of your product? All of these things are opportunities for you to think about segmentation as a way to facilitate innovation for your customer's experience with your brand and with your product. What you, what you can do is, is take this idea of what activities do we want to start, stop, or continue, and make it very manageable, very iterative to sit down and say, we're going to start doing this for this group of customer, and we'll see how it goes. And it might be very successful or it might fail, but it gives you a way to test and learn and iterate, uh, iterate uh, very quickly but it's coming from a perspective of how do you do more, how, from, to use Guy's words from this morning, how do you be on offense with this, thinking about how do you create more proactive, success-focused uh, touch points with your customers, and how does that vary based on who they are, what type of customer they are, because it can't be one size fits all in most cases. So homework assignment number one, think about your current customer set and how they would fit into different combinations of needs, priorities, activities, and metrics. And then homework assignment number two would be, with that activity concept, uh, go through and figure out what do you want to start, stop, and continue, and how might that help you focus on, are there segments of your customer base today that are underserved because you're not treating them special? You're not treating them uniquely, meeting that unique need or meeting that unique priority with some custom activity that maybe you don't do for your entire customer base because it's not scalable or it doesn't make sense. Where it fits, it fits, so do it. So, all of that said, I wanted to kind of close with just a real quick rapid fire on what are some of the top 10 lessons that I've learned from the different experiences I've had leading these, these types of teams and these types of situations, uh, and then we'll turn it over to Q&A for, for any questions that all of you have. So the first one is uh, ensure that service level agreements are shared organization-wide. And, and this may sound kind of obscure, but what I mean by this is if you're going to make a commitment to a customer that, say, that says, for this group of customer, we want to give them a special, uh, uh, we want to do a marketing campaign for them, or we want to have some part of our process that happens on this interval, or we want to give them a technical support SLA that's a little bit faster, that gives them a little bit better service. If you're going to do that and create that promise, you have to make sure the entire company is rallied behind you to deliver on that. Because to use the, the, the campaign example, if marketing isn't set up to help you with that, or if, if they're not lined up with that as a priority, it will fail. If it's a custom SLA for technical support, and your engineering and operations teams don't understand how bad it is that you're you know, 29 minutes into a 30-minute SLA and the problem still isn't solved and it's escalating to them, it's going to fail. So make sure the entire company is behind you if you're going to make a, a promise like that. Number nine would be account managers or customer success manager, however you think of it, they are an and, not an or. And what I mean by this is one of the common pitfalls I've seen, especially in very, very young companies where you're still bootstrapping and the product is still maturing and everything isn't perfectly you know, built and scaled out, is there are often new things that we want to go do. Ooh, we want it for our customers, we need to start doing this. And we haven't fully built it yet, the product isn't all the way there but we want the experience to be there, so maybe in the interim we can have their account manager or their customer success manager bridge that gap and do this manual exercise or do this thing that they wouldn't otherwise do. Does that sound familiar to anyone in the room? Is anyone saying that? I'm seeing knowing smiles. So when that happens, that's okay. If you're in an early stage company, everyone has to do their part, but make sure you plan your way out of that and make sure you keep track of how often that's happening because if you're letting your customer success organization be built into the critical path of delivery of your value chain, of whatever your product or platform does, that does not scale, and it will eventually come back to haunt you. So the, the, the next lesson from that is be very closely attuned to your product roadmap, and that's twofold importance. First, if there are cases where your teams are getting uh, tied into something that's, that's inherently operational or product functionality based, where they're kind of assisting as it grows and matures, Make sure that you're sharing that feedback with product to say, hey, when are we going to automate this? Or hey, when are we going to get that better tool for this thing that we've been doing 
because it's starting to create pressure on our team, you have to take responsibility for that as a customer success leader to advocate with the product organization to understand where that is on the roadmap and communicate trade-offs for what that's gonna mean. The other reason this is important is you need to know what's coming. So if there's a new product or new service coming uh, that, your, that your business is gonna release, you need to understand, well, what does that mean for our customer base? And if we have different segments of customer, does everybody get this new thing? Or do only certain segments or certain profiles of customers have access to that? Is it in limited availability and only available to certain people? You need to be planning for that in advance so that you don't get surprised by, good news, we're launching this new product tomorrow, and here's the questions that you may get. You need to plan much more proactively than that. And a close cousin to that is focusing on your alignment with your sales team. So let's say you go through this exercise and you come up with some ways that you wanna change how you are supporting your teams today. Um, it's probably not enough to send your sales team an email. It's probably not enough to go train them once and say, here is how we support our customers. Different customers get different experiences. You, you really need to follow up and follow up and follow up. And the best advice I can give you is shadow new salespeople in your team and hear how they talk about your customer success organization and what you do or what you don't do. That's the best way to learn like what's really sticking and what's ingrained in your sales team as how things work and, and how they're getting coaching in the field of play from senior salespeople and, and sales management. Listen to what the new salespeople are saying about how your teams engage with your customers, and that will tell you a lot about what, what your sales team thinks is the right answer. Because it's usually not malicious, it's usually, oh, I forgot or I didn't realize or I misunderstood. So repeat, 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 and, and listen and embed, especially with new people as they join, because you'll learn a lot about, are they actually setting customers' expectations correctly with what you're gonna do for them as a customer success team. And then number six, risk and opportunity can be measured, managed, and forecasted differently across segments. So one of the, when I talk about art versus science, this is something that for WP Engine, we've, we really see this manifest in how we approach our customer life cycle and how we approach the activities that we do for our customers. There are things that we do that are um, very different for some segments of our customers, and that's okay. There's some places where we can give much better visibility or much different visibility um, around where the risk is or where the opportunity is because it's more heavily weighted on science and data versus um, the relationships and the intimate knowledge of those customers that we have um, in cases where there's really small teams with very few accounts that people are managing. And that's okay, don't feel like you have to have a, a one size fits all answer for how you manage risk or how you forecast opportunity for growth or, or churn in your company. It's okay if it's different, just be very clear about what it is. And then number five, invest in a good capacity model to plan for scale. This one is really nerdy and I acknowledge that, but I think it's really important. So um, the reason I have this up here is, again, especially for growing companies, you are gonna be very heavily influenced on what you can actually go deliver to your customers if you wanna create this innovative customer experience. It's, a lot of it's gonna depend on how much capacity do you have, and a lot of that's gonna depend on what sales doing. And you need to be able to answer questions like, if my sales team doubles next year, what does that do for customer experience? How many people do I need? Am I gonna be able to, to try this new experiment that we're talking about? Or maybe sales doesn't double um, their plan. Maybe they do exactly what they said they were gonna do, but the mix is different. The swing of new business versus upsell is very different, or new product versus existing product is very different. You need to have a model that flows all the way down from sales to tell you, depending on what sales does, here's what you can expect across each of these segments that you're now starting to define for your business. And that will, that will inform how you're gonna scale those segments and how are you gonna understand if you have the right staffing, if you have the right mix of automation or, or science versus art in terms of how data-driven versus situational and contextual these decisions can be. So it's really important to have that capacity model tied all the way to sales and, and put whatever segmentation strategy you have in that capacity model so that you can see what happens and you can do different scenarios and, and see what your future holds. Number four, when you have that kind of capacity model, it needs to reflect both the count of customers and the revenue for customers. Um, every, every customer success manager's portfolio is gonna look different. And you might have one person with 20 accounts that is way more overloaded than the next person with 200 accounts, depending on what you've actually asked them to do. What are the needs and activities and priorities of those customers and, and how does your capacity map to that? If you don't know the, the difference between the, the cost to serve for those customers and the amount of customers that are there, you don't really know whether you have too much or too little in any one of those areas. And so it's really important that you think about it both in terms of how many customers is too many for the model that we have today, 
or how, many, how much revenue is too much to put in one person's hands based on the model we have today before it's time to hire another customer success manager or do something different. And then number three, make your org structure invisible to customers. What I mean by this is I, I cringe every time I hear a conversation where the word trade-off is used, or I'm sorry, handoff. When you're, when you're on the phone with a customer or back to the whole idea of a customer journey, a customer life cycle, if they're coming to you and they have a question or a problem, make sure that everyone that touches that customer in your team knows to focus on getting the customer the answer they need, getting them to the person who can help them. You don't need to stop and editorialize for them like, oh, well, you're this kind of customer, so you go to this team, so let me transfer you there. Or, oh, actually, I work on this type of issue. What you're talking about is a sales thing. Let me transfer you back to them. That might still be the right answer, but don't make it painfully obvious to customers that they're, that they're pinballing across your org structure. Make sure they feel like you respect and acknowledge where they are in their journey, and it's really about them, and it's about getting them the right help at the right time from the right person with the right activities and, and resources around that. But don't, don't make that painfully obvious to them. And then number two, define very clear roles and responsibilities for your teams across each of these segments. If you're going to do this, if you're going to say that you have a different segment of customer that you treat differently somehow, you need to be very clear about what that means. You need to make sure that team members that are in those groups understand what's different about us. What are we supposed to do differently? How are we measured if differently? Uh, what does that really mean from a day-to-day -day perspective in our daily lives? Because that living document that you can share with them to set their expectations on how they need to support your customers is also something you can share with product and with sales and with the whole uh, entirety of your, your business to make sure everyone's clear on what's happening today and what do these segments mean and who's doing what. So it's really important that that's a, a living document. And then, not surprisingly, uh, it's equally important to do that with your customers. So the, the, the strongest recommendation I can make is whatever you do from a customer segmentation perspective, again, at the end of the day, make it about your customers, make it about what you want to do for them, what new things that you can do to help spur greater adoption of your product, greater success with your platform, or just a better experience with your brand. And if you make it about them and you start to do these new activities, be very mindful about how you set expectations about what that means. Um, and give yourself some maneuverability. Don't, don't tie yourselves down to saying to a customer, great, here's exactly what you're gonna get from us. We're gonna do a weekly call every week for the rest of your life. That really might not be the right way to set the expectation. You might just wanna say, we're gonna have a regular interaction and right now we're gonna start it weekly and we'll reassess as we go from there to see what makes sense for you. But it's little tiny things like that around how you set those expectations that can really pay off later as customers move and progress across different segments or as your business changes and, and the segments change around your customers. Again, you want that to be as transparent to them as possible. At the end of the day, it should be about, as I pause to go back, beep, 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 it should be about this. Like, what are their needs? What are their priorities? And do you know what the right activities and the right metrics you have around that to make them successful and your, make your team successful? That's, that's kind of the big picture. So with that, that's all I have, and we'll kind of switch over to Q&A um, if anybody has any questions. But thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. Is there questions? So the question for those who couldn't hear in the back was, do we use any specific tools today for how we're managing those segments or how we're managing those touch points? And the answer is today, no. Today what we do is very homegrown, um, which is another thing. Like You can start very bootstrapped with this. You don't have to go big. You can start small and grow and iterate. Yes? So the question was, um, what happens if you have different permutations? So maybe you have for-profit versus not-for-profit, and then you also have maybe like region or industry or something like that. Again, that's why I say it's really unique to your business. I think ultimately this is about how you set expectations with your financial and, and sales and the rest of the, the, the fiscal leadership of your business around what do we need to plan for around how we prioritize resources around our revenue and our costs? And there may be some areas that are really important to invest in and some areas where you, you want to set a floor and say, no matter what, everyone gets this level of service, but then we want to do more over here and more over there. And so generally, the way I've seen that be really successful is to kind of set that floor and say, well, this is the standard of experience we want all our customers to have because that's our brand. And then it's about, okay, well, then above and beyond that, where do you do very targeted investments for very specific segments? And it doesn't have to be a complete um, 
coverage of all of those permutations. Like I said, you might say, um, for now, in the US, you want to segment based on something like prof for profit or not for profit. But for the rest of the world, just call that whole thing international. Because it's, so, it's small enough today that it doesn't make sense to break it down that small. It really just depends on what's the most logical um, division of, of that focus that makes sense. Other questions? Going once, <laughs> going twice. All right, thank you everybody for your time. Thanks, sir.